Howdy again, it's Mr. Pete, your interweb shop teacher. Welcome back to my basement shop, Studio B. And I'm sitting next to my Bridgeport mill, and I bought this in 1998, so I've had it for about 25 years. I love the machine, but ever since day one, I wanted a power feed, at least on the longitudinal. Could not afford it. They would make life a lot easier, although you can live without them. But the good folks at Vivor donated me one, so let me show you that, and I'm going to get it mounted here right on the end of the table and show you a lot of detail on that. So I think you'll find this interesting, and I'm really going to enjoy having this. Thank you to Iris, and there will be links in the description for uh, where you could buy one of these if you're interested. And they are really quite inexpensive, and it seems to be of pretty darn good quality so we'll go over all that and uh, hope you enjoy stick with me well don't worry I'm not gonna do an unboxing people don't like that I know I don't like it myself but there's the directions and it's very well packed and here it is quite heavy looks to be well made here's all of the accessories and on the end here you'll see the control so this is the direction, and the on and off, the speed, and this would be the rapid traverse here. Looks like there's a nice needle bearing in here. Beautiful paint job, kind of a cream color. So that's enough showing you the box. So let's go on over to the machine and prep the machine to receive this little beauty. Unfortunately, in order to install the limit switches for this device, I had to remove the uh, x-axis scale for my digital readout Accurate. I'm very hesitant to remount it over here on the back side, which some people do because of the thickness here. I will lose about two and a half inches of travel here before the actual scale would strike up against the column here. So that's not good at all. But for the purpose of this video, I took this off and I will mount the limit, the limit switches in this T-slot right here. But at a later date, if that is inconvenient, I may move the limit switches back here. Or I may actually not use them because I never leave a machine unattended while it's under power feed. But it might be foolish not to use it because it is a fail-safe. But that's all I'm going to say about that for now. Let's get into the actual heart of the matter. Let's identify some of these accessories. To start with, here is the gear made of brass, but you know what, in the directions they call it copper. I don't know why they do that. This is plastic. I would prefer if that was metal, but notice how it was shipped here with a protective cover to protect the gear teeth and uh, it is pre-lubricated, so I suppose that pre will prevent somewhat of a mess. So that, that's a pretty good idea, I think. And then in this little bag is just various washers, spacers, springs, and I don't know what all. Possibly not all of these are used on uh, various machines or are necessary. So we'll see as we go along. And these are the stops for the limit switch, and they are spring-loaded. I've never seen anything like that before. This is not plastic. It is metal, so they look to be pretty well built. So the very first thing I need to do is to install this, and you can see that the holes will line up with the other ones. This is made of aluminum, but sure is nicely machined and feels heavy and quality. Notice there's some roll pins here and some threaded holes and, and the counterboard holes and I'm going to reuse these cap screws so that we don't get into any metric stuff we don't have to worry about that but I'm going to start by removing the handle the crank this is a three-quarter hex nut which I've already loosened it was quite tight thank you Randy Set this aside to be reused. Let's remove the knurled nut. The graduated collar. 
I'm extremely hesitant to show this, but this particular piece is extremely tight. Well, not that tight where you got a bang on it, but I am using a puller and I'm being very judicious in the amount of pressure that I'm using here because I in no way want to nick it or damage it or break it or bend it or anything like that that is going to be problematic later on during reassembly. And there it is. I probably shouldn't show you this and get sidetracked here, but there is damage to this key. It's a woodruff key, and I tapped on it. I, I'm not, I don't want to damage it because it is reusable, but look at the marks right here that were put on by somebody in a repair, obviously many years ago. And that key is not in good shape, so I'm really debating on whether to bang on it and get it out of there and use a new one, or am I going to cause more trouble by doing that. So I'm just going to move on and not explain any more about that. But you're bound to run into little problems like that in any job, especially on older machines. Bubba was here 50 years ago, maybe. There's four cap screws to remove. I've already loosened them with a traditional hex key. So let's knock them off with the DeWalt. Now this whole bracket comes off, but I believe there's two roll pins in there. Do not be a bubba. Use only copper or brass punches, soft hammers, and so on. And part of the problem is I'm pulling the bearing off of the shaft at the same time that we're pulling the uh, roll pins out, which you can't see there on the back side. I suppose this is a batch number from the factory, but get everything wiped off thoroughly. If there's any burrs, remove them. Get the shaft wiped off, and then they said put a little grease on. Never assemble anything dry. And then there's a sleeve that needs to go on this step. Just like that. Next I will mount this casting with the same cap screws that I took out. And then tighten up with a regular Allen wrench. And now the main drive unit itself. And they said to grease this needle bearing where my finger is. And I already have. With that same shell grease that you saw a minute ago. And that goes on there right like that. And there are two cap screws here. And they are metric. And I will, there's a lot of holes here. I only need two of them. And as they said in the directions. Fix diagonally, so I guess whatever position you want it in. Okay, this has been a real struggle for me. I'm ready to put the brass gear, they call it copper, onto the shaft like this, but I have to set the, uh, the gear tooth clearance. That is, we don't want the gears to mesh too deeply or too lightly. So they gave us a whole handful of these spacer washers. Some are thin, some are th all different thicknesses. There must be 20 of them here. And I suppose part of the reason is this is a universal device that would fit on many different machines. But then I ran into another problem. While I do this and play around trying to get the right clearance, I need to take this on and off many, many times. I absolutely could not get it past this buggered up bubba key. So I got it out, but believe me, it was a struggle. So that's the bad one. And here's the new one that I'll put in. And I'm still not going to put it in yet until I have determined what washers that I need to do. I will do that off camera because I think that's strictly bagasse and bagasse because once the gear is put into place like this, there is no way to examine it or look in here to see how much clearance that we actually have. 
So I'll do that all off camera and then get back to you. Actually, it's about two hours later. I had a little bit of a struggle. First of all, I needed to ream this just a little bit. It didn't take much, but it wouldn't quite go on. But remember that when you ream a workpiece with a keyway, it's essential that you use a spiral reamer. Luckily, I had one. You see how nice that works? Rather than, this is a different size, but rather than a straight fluted. So I've talked about that before. So now this goes on very freely because I didn't want to struggle with it taking it on and off as I decided what or how many washers I needed and I finally determined about two of them and time will tell if that works all right so uh, then I ran into yet another problem this is an eighth inch Woodruff key that's an eight <laughs> one eighth inch <laughs> keyway in the shaft this is a three millimeter. Well, that won't fit. So that's why you'll see, you'll see here in uh, future footage that the device is back on the mill and I had to take the mill and it didn't take much. I had eight thousandths to take off. Just make a little step on each side and that's already here so I'm not going to take that back out to show you. But now as you can see it fits freely. right in and feels like the mesh is good and I'm ready to continue assembly but that was a little bit of a struggle and I hope you guys can take care of little problems like that by yourself okay final assembly now there's a flat washer here and it really doesn't the directions aren't very good it just doesn't tell you where these things go, but since it fits there, I assume that's where it belongs on that side rather than this side. Now we're using the old graduated dial made of cast iron, and unfortunately the original neural nut is imperial thread, so that cannot be used, and I will use the provided one. However, it is plastic. I don't really like that very much. Look at that. It wobbles. But again, the purpose of that is to hold the graduated collar and loosen it and you can zero it out. And then last but not least, and you know, you ought to put a little oil on these. I'm not going to take the time to grab the can right now, but put the ball crank on. But I notice there's not very much thread left for the nut. And I am kind of wondering why, although it's a thin nut. And I'll put that on and tighten her down. Yeah, I guess it's enough. But you know, now something is too tight. So obviously I need more washers. I, I need to go back and do that. I'm going to do that off camera because there's an awful lot of fussing and fiddling with that. But as I tighten this up, as I tighten the nut up, this tightened up. So something is rotten in Denmark and now it's loose again. I'll be back in 15 minutes. Okay I had to take it apart about three times and there's a total of about eight washers in there now and this the nut is tight and it feels just about right. Now another thing do not throw these other parts away. And I will put these in the cabinet that's on the other side of the column here. I'll probably even wire them together and date them and all of, all of that. Now let's give it a test run. But before that, we need to install the uh, limit switch. And even before that, let me show you one other thing. I've told you many times I'm a hopeless insomniac. So while you were sleeping last night, I came down here and mounted this strip. I was going to put a regular old handy box on there. Thought I had it laying here or something. Yeah, right here. One of these. But I thought, well, I already had this and it's got a circuit breaker on it. And I wanted several outlets anyway in case I needed to use my electric drill. And then there's a, this cord here is for that light that goes right on the quill. The, the hound dog light. You remember that? So that's the purpose of that. And this is for 
the power feed and I will off camera get this all wrapped up they call that cord control my <laughs> one of my grandsons called that cord control so I need to do that and also the cord that is for the limit switch is, has to be controlled so let's go back to the other side okay these uh, stops can be adjusted of course however you have to have a wrench and it has to be metric but here's the limit switch I got that mounted I was a little disappointed I have six washers flat washers stacked up on either either side I do not like the looks of that because it just didn't line up with these so what I did or will do is I'll take this bushing here off camera later on and part it off and make some thick washers it will look a lot better and then I, I've never seen one of these before but that goes over there I suppose to uh, prevent damage by oil and chips but it, I guess it just lays on there loose and goes one way or the other but I it just seems kind of cheesy and these are the leftover parts well now it's plugged in let's check it out I'm sure everyone knows what a limit switch is for but as I told you earlier you shouldn't leave a machine but if you did and you forgot about it watch it stops go the other way and you can quickly adjust these however you need a wrench as already explained I don't want to be too critical but I suppose some of these faults are because they are making this product to fit many different machines so we had to shim the switch which doesn't look real good and then the other problem remember was that the key here we got a, a little conflict here between metric and imperial but I was able to fix that and you can too because you're a machinist or you wouldn't even be watching this well it's very typical of these foreign made products that they produce a poor manual however this particular one is made on beautiful slick expensive paper and it's even in color on the inside but they've reduced the entire installation to six steps and the wording is not very good at all so you might get some information from the pictures but in general as usual directions not good this is the slowest speed that I can get out of this thing I'm not sure what it is in inches per minute but let's take a few cuts practice cuts here I'll move the camera okay let's give it a try This seems to be about the slowest speed that I can get. I'm a little disappointed with that, but it has tremendous torque. I really can't stop it, and I'm not going to force it, but it really seems to, to move under a great deal of power. So as far as criticizing, again, the manual isn't very good. I didn't like the idea that I had to use all those spacer washers under the uh, limit switch it just looks cheap and uh, finally I did have to spend an awful lot of time modifying that Woodruff key in other words adapting it be from uh, Imperial into metric but I did surmount that difficulty other than that and possibly not quite a slow enough feed rate it looks to be a pretty good value especially for 
the price of only about $135. So again, look down in the description. In concluding this video on the Viver Power Feed, it grieves me to tell you that I do not recommend that you buy this. And the whole problem, as far as I'm concerned, is that the speed is not quite slow enough, at least as far as I'm concerned, in trying to get a very fine finishing cut. But, stick with me here, there's just a little extra credit where I think I've found a fix for that, although I sh do not believe that you should have to have a fix, but let's take a look at that. It may change your mind and even my mind. First of all, let me show you something here, and that is that I reinstalled the digital readout on the front of the table. Remember earlier in the video I showed you that I took this off and I put the limit switches on here, but I really can't do without my DRO, and it was not really a uh, possible for me to mount it on the back side. I, I explained that earlier. However, I fully intend to mount the limit switches on the back side, but that might be a video in itself if I ever get around to it. Okay, here's the fix that I'm using to get a slower speed. I had in stock, and you've probably seen it above my bench, this Dremel speed control. I've had this forever, but I connected this to the Avivor power feed here and it's simply plugged into the back side as you plug in any device that you want to slow down and it gives me a lot slower speed I'm losing torque but it seems to work alright and I'm going to take a couple cuts to prove that alright see that the lever is already engaged here but as I turn this on and you can turn it on and off here that'll totally turn off the unit but turning that on and then adjusting this, you can see that I'm getting, well, that's not all that slow, but watch how slow I can make it. However, at that real slow speed, there isn't a whole lot of torque, but it seems to be enough torque to make uh, an actual cut. So now I'm going to aim the camera at the work and cut some steel here. And it is serviceable, but again, that's a fix that we should not have to do, but it's making it work, and that's all that I really care about. Using the Dremel speed control, and that's a block of steel, half-inch cutter, and it's only a 25 thousandths depth of cut, but nevertheless, I've got a pretty darn slow feed. I do not know what it is in inches per minute, but it is satisfactory, at least at the moment. Now this is a 50 thousandth depth of cut, same cutter, same steel. a little bit faster feed. Let me try slowing it down just a little bit. And it still seems to have the torque to make that cut. Well, that's finally the end of the video. I hope you got something out of it, and I think there's still a lot of good about this. And leave your comments. What do you think? The link is in the description if you are interested, even though I really do not recommend it. So long for now. Mr. Pete.